interested in testing in some new districts. Could be the District of Columbia, could be Baltimore, could be others. The idea of a half price, half dosage model. This is a every day on the kids' schedule, but in high schools that could pair this with a different elective that meets half the time, we could try this where the kids come every other day, and therefore an individual tutor would have roughly double the caseload, thereby reducing the per pupil cost dramatically. So we'd like to test that and see if the effect size is exactly half of what the full dosage is. Could it be more than half? Maybe there's some plateau, or would it be less than half? And let districts choose. Look, we can afford the half price, half dosage model. The effect you'll get on that is gonna be very impressive, or we wanna choose the full price, full dosage model, which at larger scale, we project to be a number beginning with two. So we're still sensitive about the price. We wanna try technology. In tutorial as a way to, again, increase the student caseload per tutor. We have two kids are working on a technology platform while two are getting the, the saga tutoring and they flip. So they're getting, again, half the dosage from the tutor, increasing the caseload and the student load of the tutor. We wanna test those things and show what they show and follow what the evidence, where the evidence leads. We're committed to that. So uh, we're very eager to do that. And it's one of the reasons we came here is see if we could interest the district, uh, some district schools and Baltimore schools uh, to consider being a test ground for that. That might be very helpful and uh, make this uh, even more accessible to more kids. Uh, more questions? Uh, right over here in the back. Uh, oh, right here. Okay. I, I'm Andy Klingenstein. Um, whether you know this for sure, uh, whether you've tested it for sure, can you say what you suspect are the magic uh, components of this from how you select these teachers to the to the number, because um, it seems deceptively simple, but nothing is deceptive is, is as simple as it seems. So, what's really behind this, do you think? John, you want to start, and then I'd like to ask Antonio. So, will you start on that. So, I, I have uh, a few thoughts on that. The first is that um, if you if you walk into one of these the classrooms, and I've done this a bunch of times over the last few years, uh, my first reaction is that it looks different from a regular classroom in one particular way, which is that there's a lot of kids in the room, and they're all doing math. But you walk in, if you walk into a regular math class, it doesn't look like people are doing math. You walk into this, it looks like they're doing math. And if you just sit and watch for a 55 minute period, this is a very unscientific uh, estimate, I'd say each kid is sitting there doing math problems for 40 minutes. Uh, and the rest of it, they're talking to the tutor t t when they're stuck on something. And so, you know, one, this is, this is deceptively simple, but I think the idea is if you can get somebody to do math for 40 minutes a day, every single day for a, school, for a full school year, they'll get better at math. So then the question is, how do you get somebody to do math for 40 minutes a day, every day of the school year? And Part of it is having a tutor who's across the table from you, who's the same person every day, who's encouraging you when the math gets hard to keep going. Part of it is giving the kid a math problem that they actually can do, and then having them learn, oh, I can do this, so then they want to keep going, as opposed to giving them something that, you know, no one who can't, who doesn't understand what a negative number is, can factor a polynomial. That's just impossible. But if you give them you work on negative numbers for a while, they'll figure that out and we'll go on to fractions and then et cetera, et cetera. So I think that those things are part of it. The other thing is in some of the research we did, we did some surveys and we asked kids a bunch of questions in both the treatment and the control group. And many of them were actually trying to get it, the, why the, this other program, the Becoming a Man program was working. But uh, on this very long list of, of questions, the only things that we saw differences in responses are on were a few things. They were. Uh, the kids in the program are more likely to say they like math. They're more likely to say they were good at math. Uh, they weren't more likely to say they liked reading or they were good at reading. And then uh, they were more likely to say that their friends don't study enough. <laughs> now, their friends didn't change how much studying they did. What my interpretation of that is that they have learned that if you study, and maybe study means to like try while you're, while you're sitting there in class. Uh, if you study, it actually works, you learn stuff, and that feels good. And so they think, well, if my friends were smart, they'd be doing this too. So I think it's sort of a combination of all that stuff. Hey, Kathy, could you give Antonio the microphone? Uh, talking about the, the recruitment piece? Sure, what makes, well, how do you pick, get tutors to want to do this work, and, and what are the kind of people who, who want to do this work? I think, 
like everything within this organization, it starts with the why. It comes from the heart. Um, you know, I think we're, we're a mission-driven organization, and what we're doing is mobilizing recent college graduates, mid-career individuals and re retirees around service so that they can transform the lives of students. And they, a lot of the individuals we interact with are people who are looking for access in, into education, but they don't want to worry about managing a large classroom full of students. They, want, they don't want to worry about designing their own curriculum. They just want to focus on working with two students and building a relationship with those students. And those are the kind of people we're identifying. When I'm thinking about my experience working with the tutor, I'm not just thinking about, when I reflect and think about my experience working with the tutor when I was with, at uh, Match Education, I don't think about our work on academics, although my tutor played a huge role in developing my academic skills, but I think about the relationship we had together. He talked to me about why college is important, not just to a means to an end, but as a way to grow as a leader. Those are the things that I remember. And that's what people find appealing about this work. And um, so at SOG Innovations, we have a national recruitment campaign and recruit talent from across the nation, 100 plus colleges and universities. Um, a lot of the fellows we get involved you know, are interested in either pursuing a career in education or nonprofit work, or they're looking to defer law school, medical school, or business school for a year um, uh, to do something meaningful as a gap year opportunity. Uh, so a lot of our work is really focused on building relationships with local colleges and universities, very much a grassroots campaign. Uh, so that's essentially what, you know, what we do as an organization as a nutshell. Any other follow-up questions on that? No, that's great. Thank you. We've had um, anywhere from eight to 17 applicants for every tutor job wherever we've been. There's a huge supply of people who want to serve underserved kids, but there aren't enough spots for them right now in schools. Because really, you can apply to be a teacher, but so many of them are going to fry in the challenge of being a rookie teacher. But to be a tutor is a much more nurturing ramp way up to becoming a teacher. That's why I think we have this demand, because we ask for 10 months of service. By the way, 20 to 40 percent want to stay even after that, and they have a caseload of two per period, not 30. That's the difference. I'm going to take an executive authority and extend the briefing by five minutes. Um, I, we start on time, though, if you recall. You know, don't, I don't want to penalize the punctual, but I don't mind extending those who stay. So let's take another five minutes, and after that, uh, we are inviting you down the stairs, just out to the right, one floor down, and we have actual refreshments and continue the conversation, if you like, with individuals uh, in the room. So uh, maybe two more questions. Can I just make a quick editorial comment? Sure. Um, so I, it is an amazing program to the gentleman's question, and I think there are a lot of pieces that make it very special. But I think one thing that does not get enough attention is having a district like Chicago who is willing to really take the leap of faith. Um, there are a lot of sort of rules and regulations and you know a lot of reasons why programs like that can't get in. And CPS said, we're going to make this happen. And they did a lot. And they you know, really should get credit uh, for being willing to do that, making it a credit-bearing course, having it, uh, the course is listed in the, in the catalog. There were a lot of things. So I just think it's super important that you know, political will and the determination to do this and having a good program. Because even if you had a great program, if CPS didn't let you in, it wouldn't matter. Yeah, and I just want to underscore that. Having the support of the mayor's offices has been very helpful. Both uh, Mayor Emanuel in Chicago is very supportive of it. I heard that three weeks ago he gave us a shout out. Uh, the mayor of New York's office, the mayor's office of criminal justice helped bring us there. And having city supports like Chicago to do a randomized trial, it takes a little courage in education. That's why there are very few randomized control trials in education. People think it's hurting kids. It's actually a way to uh, provide an opportunity to help kids and to prove that it could work for the kids. So very grateful to Chicago, unlike New York, agreed to do an RCT. <laughs> we, love, we love New York, but uh, here they made a mistake. Hi, I'm Cheryl Goldstein at the Weiberg Foundation. Um, uh, you had mentioned that you had done this in middle school level, I guess in New York, and I was just wondering if you're seeing the same types of results and if you're able to say what, if any, impact it's having on Algebra One success. Again, as John mentioned, we have just finished our first full year in New York. We had a little trial with just high school in New York. Uh, a four-month trial, and now we finished our first year of middle school kids. We don't have enough data to, to give you an answer. I apologize for that. When we do, we'll get it to you. Um, Barbara, you visit New York. You visit our middle school. What do you see? You'll have a little anecdotes here, Cheryl, but not data yet. The, um, the school in New York is a, a very busy place. 
it is amazing and I was commenting before the difference that just a couple of years can make in the engagement with the kids um, John was commenting that our most of our saga students in math lab they do about 40 minutes of math uh, a, a day uh, in their math lab I we aim for 95% time on task at the middle school that goes through the roof if you see a high schooler working 40 minutes those middle schoolers are working even harder because at that age they're still very much wanting to please the adult. So when you place a, a young adult, and we have some mid-career professionals, like I was a mid-career tutor, and we have some retirees as well. But when you place an adult that is giving them that much <coughs> attention, it really gets their engagement level up to a level higher than what I've seen in the high schools. So that is just anecdotal for now, but I am very excited about the, the, uh, the data and see what it will show. And this model has been done at the match schools of Boston from pre-K to 12. So there's additional information there. There's not a randomized trial because it's for every kid in the school. Um, maybe one or two quick questions. Kumar. Yeah. So I was curious. Kira, could you give uh, Mr. Garland the microphone? So I was, I was curious for the schools and the districts where you guys have implemented whether it's had a broader cultural impact outside of the saga classrooms on the way mm -hmm. math is taught. Yes, um, is the answer to that, but I will elaborate in terms of not just, I was talking about the teachers and programmatically how that works, but also um, for the parents, and I wanna go back to that, Alan. Um, students, when they have a lot of confidence, when they feel good about their learning, they go home, they share that, they want their parents to come in and see that. And so we've had a lot of students dragging parents into the building to the point that um, some of the tutors organize events outside of the math lab to bring parents, to bring tutors, I mean to bring parents and other family members in. I was just talking to Rakia earlier. The tutors really operate outside of the classroom, changing the culture of the school because they become part of the fabric of the school. They are not just tutors, they then become representatives of the school, sponsors of clubs, uh, making sure that they make those connections with parents. When you have that kind of energy in a high school specifically that is really um, traditionally in my school's case in an impoverished neighborhood that's powerful that's bringing parents in that's bringing other teachers in and that's changing the culture of the school also to the point where now we're asking ourselves math lab is so wonderful and the tutors are so good we really need to do this in literacy and so that conversation begins other conversations and when you have that type of energy then you are changing the culture of the school because you're ch changing the way that the students are learning the adults are learning the parents are learning so to answer your question dramatically changes the culture of the school thank you um, if there's one burning question it's going to be the best question of the day let's take it otherwise we'll adjourn it but i'm i'm open to that if that person has the courage to raise his or her hand <laughs> Not a lot of pressure on this, because it's really a friendly room. Who's got that question? You do? Okay, Catherine, right here. <laughs> that was an impossible bar, but um, I'm Aurora Steinley with the Deputy Mayor for Education's office here in DC. Um, and I was hoping we could just have a few more seconds talking about the data that you guys use. Um, I was wondering if there's anything else that you've observed from the data about when this program works best, or maybe when it doesn't work, so not to focus on what doesn't work, but it looks like there's a portion of students for which it didn't end up prevent them from failing, or um, I was wondering if you've been able to unpack that at all, and also whether there's any other indicators that weren't on the slides, like maybe attendance, that you guys are also monitoring along the way. I do approve of the question. Enough? That was a great question. Thank you. <laughs> that was an excellent question. Uh, so we have looked at some other outcomes. Um, so for we you know, actually, uh, Chicago Public Schools is great data and um, has been very uh, generous with us in, sh in sharing it for research purposes. So um, we're able to do a lot of, uh, of you know, one thing that, ma that makes doing a randomized control trial cost, uh, um, you know, where we can do it at a reasonably low cost is because the, sh the district collects data that we can use to measure outcomes. So we have looked at attendance. Um, depending on the year, sometimes we see a positive attendance effect and sometimes we don't. Um, uh, we looked at uh, disciplinary uh, uh, events. Um, again, sometimes we've seen little things there, but not much. Um, uh, in terms of looking at, you know, trying to figure out for, for which kids it works better for versus others, we've done a lot of looking and haven't found uh, very different 
uh, effects across different groups of kids yet, but that's ongoing work. Um, so I'd say like, you know, my, so far I'd say it looks like it, you know, there, there aren't groups of students for whom it looks like it, it's not effective, um, nor groups where it looks like it's, you know, uh, you know, extremely effective, but that's, you know, I'd say very preliminary work. All right, that'll be the last geeky word on this uh, session. So thank you all for coming again. Thank you all for you're invited to go downstairs to the right. There's refreshments and continue the conversations. Thank you. Here.